Welcome. This is the 29th of July. It's Google Summer of Code, Git Cache Automatic Maintenance Project. Rishikesh, do you have any questions? I guess I should ask, how are your exams? Uh, going good. I do my exams finish. So yeah, uh, I will, before we get started, I wanted to you know, let you know that next week I wouldn't be able to attend the meeting. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then the next meet I've checked is on uh, 10th of August. Uh, we can schedule that again to a Friday. So that, oh, good. You know, yeah. By then my exams would be done. Okay. So let's, let's, let me make that correction. That way I'll, it'll be very clear to all of us. So Monday or Tuesday, let's see, Wednesday, August 3rd, we'll cancel, right? Because that's your examinations. Yeah. Okay. So deleting that one, uh, exam week and all the best on your exams. That's, that's yeah. great. And then on the week of August 10, it would be better if we made it August 12. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to move that to August 12. Move to August 12 so that it to be after exams are complete. All right, very good. Okay, so schedule has been adjusted. Then the, the next week, that week of August 17th, it's okay to go back to the 17th to the Wednesday? Yeah. yeah, yeah okay, yeah. great. All right, excellent. Okay, so Rishab, welcome. We just adjusted schedules. We won't meet next week because Prushikesh is in, in exams next week. And the following week, we will meet on the 12th of August instead of meeting on the uh, 10th of August. Hi, all. Uh, all right, ma'am. That seems fine to me. Great. Thank you. Hi, Rishab. Hi, Rishkesh. Oh, sorry. I should be polite, too. Hi. Hi, Rishab. <laughs> hi. Hi. Uh, congrats uh, on your presentation, Rishkesh. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It was uh, absolutely I awesome. Did. Yeah, I did, uh, you know, uh, in my sub the presentation, uh, you know, the demonstration. It took a bit time, uh, much, you know. Uh, when I was demonstrating, there were uh, there was a bug. Before uh, starting the demonstration, everything worked fine. Okay, I don't know what happened during the presentation. If if you have not failed in at least one live demonstration, you've clearly not done enough demonstrations. <laughs> That's simply the nature of demonstrations, right? It's it, it, yeah. if you you clearly need more, you need to do more demonstrations if you've never failed. Because I I don't know anybody who will tell you, oh yes, my demonstrations always work, unless their technique for demonstrations is because I always record them on video before. And I make sure they pass when I do the recorded video. It's like that's not a demonstration. That's totally cheating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So, what topics, or do you have any topics? I know that you're you're in preparation for exams. Are there topics you wanted to discuss? What would you like to review, etc.? Oh, uh, I wanted to discuss, you know, the agenda of, you know, phase two of uh, GSOC, like what are we going to do, what would be the goals, and how would we proceed towards that. Okay. So, yeah, uh, there are a few doubts, like, regarding UI, okay, how would we redefine the UI to make it user-friendly, okay, and then... Yeah, there are a few points which I have, like, which we can discuss. The first being uh, regarding the caches, okay? So uh, we decided to display, uh, you know, data regarding how the, you know, how frequently the maintenance tasks has been run, on which caches they have been run in a table format, right? So how do we proceed with that? That was one thing. And the other thing was, the uh, we are using uh, you know uh, what do you call that uh, cache entries okay we don't have the name of the git repository which we are running on so how would we show the administrator 
uh, which uh, which a repository is taking how much space and how much execution time. So, so the administrator only knows the repository if they know about it at all. They only know it by its cache directory name, right? So, to the administrator, they don't know which repository it it is a cache. It, it is caching. And so it seems like to the administrator, we need to show the cache directory name, but if we could using a git call or a jgit call determine the repository that, that that is caching, that will help them, at least it would help me because when I see a two gigabyte repository, I won't panic if I see right next to it that it's stable-linux.git. Right, I say, oh yeah, I know that's a monster, and and it's always going to be a monster. It, it is unavoidably large. Or if I see Git plugin and it's four hundred megabytes, it's oh something's wrong there because that repository should not be four hundred megabytes large. So if it's possible for you to, and I think it is with a JGit call or with a with a call to Git to ask what is the what is the remote that's 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 being cached in this repository. Uh, but then each uh, you know each remote has a different URL, so a different syntaxes would be you know like a GitHub uh, remote would have a different syntax, and then now uh, as you know GitLab would have a different syntax. So how would we again differentiate between all of them? And and for me the if the table if the table said here's the cache directory name. And that is a unique name, right? Every directory is uniquely named. And then on the same row, it says, and here's the repository it is caching. And so they may then, and even better if we then allow them to do things like sort the list of, of cached repository names, they may say, oh, that's funny. Why am I caching a copy of this with Git protocol and a copy of it with HTTPS protocol? That seems wasteful. So we may then get some bug reports saying, why don't you get smarter if, if we're inadvertently caching two copies of it? Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. Uh, and I have another doubt regarding uh, the data. Where are we going to store it? Like, are we storing it in a file in Jenkins? Do I have to create a file or is there something already in Jenkins which helps me write uh, all the data which I need into that file and then read it again in you know the maintenance UI so that I can display. Also, how frequently do I, you know, remove data from that file because it keeps growing, right? So yeah, and what I've seen Jenkins, it's not uncommon for Jenkins things to completely rewrite a data file as they generate it every time. So so now, how frequently to refresh it? If, if it were refreshed at the end of every cache maintenance task, meaning, okay, we did GC. And at the end of GC, if we updated that data, that seems like that's good enough. If we did a commit graph and updated the data, that seems good enough to me. Now, during the run of that GC operation, while it's process iterating through each of the caches, the data will be out of date. But for me, I think, I think that's okay. If, if, it were, if we said, oh no, we want to be even better, you might say at each subtask in the GC, we will rewrite the data. But my worry is many of these caches will be quite small and you'll waste a bunch of time rewriting data. Whereas if you just wait till the end of all of the, the whole end of the task, that's good enough. Rishab, any, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I think that makes sense, Mark. I mean, to do it uh, after the whole maintenance process has been over uh, seems much more. Uh, and the incentive that you do it after each um, particular repository seems so what would be the benefit the benefit would be the user would be able to see the data at that time right but I, yeah i mean it doesn't seem that much of a big of a benefit as compared to seeing it at the end of the whole execution particularly yes. with as we think about gc is probably an exception here but 
the commit graph operation seems to be relatively quick, Prushikesh, right? If I remember mm -hmm. correctly, it's not hours to generate a commit graph. Yeah. And so yeah. waiting until the end of all the commit graph processing is probably still not dramatically different in terms of time than doing it on every one. Like those, if we are going to do it like after all the uh, internet, uh, after all the uh, after the task is completed, then we'll have to store it, right? We'll have to remember the state of each cache. What was it? Did it execute or not? How, what was the execution time for each maintenance task? And then write it. Hmm. Yes. That at least that's what I was assuming. Is is you want? But but we've already got. We've already got. Well, no. Do we? I. Yeah, yes, I would think you want some data structure that says, here is here is a cache directory name, <clears throat> and here is the here is the matching repository for it, and then the run the runtime information for the various things. Now, I guess it's a valid question. What about the Jenkins controller that has a thousand or ten thousand caches on it? But that kind of controller, since these caches come from multi-branch pipelines, right? That kind of controller is probably already catastrophically loaded. So, so I'm, I guess I'm just on the assumption an in-memory copy of that data is probably not heavy enough to cause us concern. I like Rishab is wondering. That's good. Yes. And I was thinking, so there's a, I was thinking about the trade-off, right? I mean, either you have a, an increasing size uh, of, let's say, an inter so you're, when you're storing it in memory, that versus uh, this would be an IO operation each time, right? So, so frequency of IO operation would, I would say, have more effect on performance as compared to as far as i can understand having a growing in memory um, right yeah i mean cache, io yeah. is what 10x or 100x slower any io is 10x or 100x slower than memory access so yeah so you're you're if now there are plenty of things in jenkins that write small files right there are many many things that do that and so we would not be alone if we were writing small if we wrote wrote every time. So, or if we said, hey, we're not gonna keep it in memory, we'll always read it from disk. But for me, it's, I, I, I don't see a, a lot to be gained by saying, oh, we'll, we'll not keep it in memory. Do we, uh, do we have asynchronous processes in our plugin? Do we, uh, I mean, do, we do that? That uh, like uh, like can I launch uh, launch an asynchronous thread and let it do this while the main execution thread is not affected by uh, the I/O operation? Well, I mean, Rushikesh has already created threads that that are doing the tasks. I think what you're asking is, could there be another thread which does the the data gathering, right? And I, I think there could be if that helps. Yes, I mean, he is creating threads, but if if the if the program is, I mean, he would essentially let's say after the execution task has been done, he would make an I/O call. So, so that thread would then whichever thread has done the execution would go for that one. And I don't know if that is then. Be, so essentially, what what my point is that if we could separate out certain threads from the pool to do this job while majority of the chunk is forming the main execution of the program, then uh, knowing that IO could, uh, you know, it should not affect the user's performance or it should not take resources from the main task that is present here. I mean, that is why we would have an asynchronous process, right? So launch a thread that is not time bound in terms of, we. it's not necessary for us to, uh, uh, refresh that file or the status at the exact same time when the task has been done but let's say loosely it takes some time and you know does it and gives us the result so if if that is possible i mean i haven't seen asynchronous um 
threads. I mean, uh, I mean, Jenkins, I don't know how that works. Well, and, and maybe do we even do we even need a thread in that case, or is it that we take the concept of queue and at the end of at the end of processing a task, GC commit graph, whatever prefetch, it drops its data onto a queue to be processed whenever something processes that queue. I mean, Jenkins certainly has lots of queues, right? There's a job queue that runs runs its queues. So if we were if we were really concerned, oh, this may be just too much data, we could instead say, hey, let's drop it onto a queue. We won't we won't write it to the we won't write it to the final data structure. We'll just drop it onto a queue and let, as you suggested, something process it later. If it if it's if processing is expensive. Now I'm I'm not seeing a case where I would expect this result data to be expensive to process, right? Because Rushikesh, the things I think you, I thought you were describing was repository a directory name, URL of the repository, and probably time to execute each of the tasks in the list. So. Mm -hmm. So if it, it took 50 milliseconds to execute this task, or it took 500 seconds to execute this task, that will be visible to the user so that they know, oh, here's where you're spending time on these cache maintenance efforts. I mean, um, not that the, the amount of whatever you want to store in a file is and uh, the processing associated processing time that is going Let's say even if it's minor, I think the whole point as we were discussing was that IO execution takes more. I mean, it's it's a heavier. I mean, in terms of time, right? So to separate that out, and since that being a backend process, not something that the user has to be concerned about, is why I was saying that if we could separate it out. But again, I mean, again, the option that we could let all the tasks run and then just do it at a single go also makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to, uh, yeah, we don't need to have mechanisms, complex mechanisms there. And uh, do I have to create like my own file or is there something already in Jenkins which, you know, helps me do that, you know, which helps me uh, store all this data and then I read it into the UI. I, th I think there are facilities in Jenkins that will store data data like that. So the the example, I think you've actually already used it, is that there's an XML file that's created that tracks the configuration of a of a task. Right? When is when does it execute? And there, what you, what that's doing is storing data for you. Now now. I'm I'm thinking now. Where would we point you to find an example of something that's storing data? I wonder. Maybe we should have you look at the metrics plugin um, because it certainly stores data about things like. Well, let's see. I'm going to bring I'm going to bring it up to show because this this is a hint. Maybe where we should have you look. Okay. So if I look at this thing, you okay if I share my screen? So here is share screen. We're going to share this screen. Okay. So on this screen, what you see is the, the CI server that we've used for past experiments, right? So it's got quite a collection of agents, some online, some offline, et cetera. And one of the things that I can do is look at one of the Windows agents. And if I then look at this label, AMD 64 Windows, and click this load statistics, it's going to show me load statistics for the Windows, the all the nodes that have this label. And so what you see here is, okay, what you see here is a sign that I did something to my my CI server that I shouldn't have done. 
what you see is there were three agents available here for quite a period. And then we grew to have 11 executors available. And this shows when they're busy and the busy, the red line, and this is time over. So something is keeping this data, right? Someplace this data is being stored. And, and so this metrics thing might be a place for you to look to see how, does, how, how should we do data storage. Now that's that's not a terribly terribly fulfilling answer. I apologize, Rishikesh. I've not done the kind of data storage that you're looking for. If that's not enough, though, I'm confident we can find people um, that can help us help us help us get the answer you need. Because I never researched about this area. Or right. Exactly. Area. This is. This is now in phase two. We're saying, oh, guess what, Rishikesh? It's time to do some research. This won't be code. This will be find, find the technique that Jenkins uses to do this and, and use that technique. Uh, it's, it, unfortunately, it's the same pattern that we applied for Rishab a few years ago, where halfway into the project, we realized there were things we just hadn't known um, at the start of the project. We simply were ignorant of them. And it meant, oh, we've got to go do this. Rishab has to go do this research. It's not we in this case. Mark certainly didn't do the research. So same thing I think for you is this is a topic that I don't have an answer for. We see examples that there are things that do give answers to this, but I don't exactly know how it does it. But again, I, I know people who know. So if, if, if it turns out that you don't find it in a reasonable time, let me know and we'll find others to give us coaching. Sure. Uh, this is the metrics plugin, right? I think so. Yeah, I think. Let's see if I can find hints as to where that's from. Let's see. Take your overview. Yeah, I think. Well, let, let me show you the other place where you can see that same kind of data. That way, you know. And don't look at the number of plugins I haven't updated yet. I should look at them on my plugin updates. I haven't restarted this in several days. Okay, we need the thing that is monitoring of Jenkins. Oh, load statistics here. This is the top level load statistics for the entire system. So what we see here is there was a, there was a period where I had a hundred available executors and or a hundred, yeah. Oh no, no, this is a Q length. I had a Q length of a hundred and it finally tapered down because my executors were here to do the work. And there's the, there's the picture, yeah. So if nothing else, you could search through the code base looking for load statistics. Is that comfortable enough? It, sorry, it's not a great answer. It's not the, oh yes, this is how we do it. Uh, I'll, I'll have a look into it uh, okay. sometime. Yeah. And uh, there was another thing uh, regarding, like we discussed uh, initially regarding repository exclusion. Like uh, currently we are running maintenance tasks on all the cache. So do we, so we want, we planned of adding a way to exclude repositories from, uh, you know, maintenance. Okay. So, and mm -hmm. then we thought we'll do it based on regular expressions or, you know, based on the size of the cache. Uh, uh, do, uh, so the thing about regular expressions is uh, as usual, we don't have the, you know, uh, uh, what do you tell, the repository, uh, like the repository name. Uh, and uh, I wanted to know, like, are there any other way? Uh, do we want other ways of, you know, excluding repositories from Git maintenance? Mm. So for me, repository URL already covers more more cases than I would initially expect. I I'm not even sure we have to allow that people can exclude cache maintenance, right? It's okay. 
this is this is for the health of their system and we trust that command line git knows what it's doing when it optimizes a repository now with git 1.8 on centos 7 maybe not and and maybe we just tell those people they have to upgrade to an operating system that doesn't use such an ancient version of git Uh, so, so you are suggesting to you know uh, not go towards it and not implement it. Or... I I I would not object if we didn't do exclusions. But if you can find a way to do exclusions, I'm sure there will be users that will be pleased. Users who say, "Look, I know that I want to garbage collect. I want to garbage collect." everything except this one monster repository that I maintain myself. It's 32 gigabytes of repository. I know it's bad and I know I know enough about it that I periodically flush it completely and re, re, refetch the whole thing. I, I, I had one of those kind of repositories at a, a, a job five or six years ago and it, the the pain of carrying around that kind of baggage is awe inspiring. I think it's an enhancement. I mean, uh, once your functional uh, whatever goals that you have are completed, then probably it's something that you could take a look at. But not before that, yeah, it doesn't seem something that we should spend our focus on that. Right. Uh, because I want to get the, my goals clear, like what exactly uh, do I need to do, you know, or what are the main things I need to focus on. So I thought this was part of it. But uh, so right now, I think the main thing would be to display uh, uh, the execution data. Uh, and uh, I, I think I, I don't find anything else. Uh, redesigning the UI, I think that would be something I would need to focus I, on. I have a concern. I was looking at the PR, not a concern, but rather a question. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt Rishikesh. If you don't have anything else, I would then like to speak. Uh, do you want to finish? No, no, it's fine. Sir. So I was looking through the code, and um, this is particularly related to task executor. Um, I, I think there's, there's a piece there where you're locking, um, uh, you're initiating a lock and then you the bulk of the operation that is performed by Git is being locked and then uh, unlocked. So what, so first thing that I was thinking, I don't know if it's, it's an exercise worth having or not, but we should, um, we should do an analysis of the threads. Uh, or the state of the thread by taking a thread dump or the JVM to see what is the state of my, what are the threads that we're using and the threads that we're not using, what, what is happening to them while, while all of the bulk of the operations, uh, say, you know, five tasks are configured for uh, a good amount of repositories, what is happening internally? Because my, what, so what I, what my concern is that when we are, uh, applying a lock to the whole operation. How do we define the behavior of the rest of the threads that come to that operation point? Uh, I mean, what happens to them? Are they, are they waiting until the lock is released or should they ignore if the lock is already acquired by someone? Do you come to that point? You ignore it, you move forward because my, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, if my understanding here is incorrect, but what I understood from the code was that if I launch multiple tasks, there will be threads that will be waiting at that point to acquire the lock. And since it has been acquired by someone who is doing the gate operation, and so this exposes not exposes, but this is a, so this is a direct relationship between the amount of time that an execution of Git is taking with the amount of time you're going to lock a resource. And if a resource is logged, the other threads won't be able to. Uh, uh, I mean, we haven't defined a behavior that would let them uh, wait for a certain time or not wait at all and move forward. So this was something that I um, wanted to understand uh, how, how we want to do it. My concern was, are we, is there a growing number of waiting or block threads because of what we're doing? 
that is the first question if that is answered by um, if you if you know the answer to it it's great if you don't then just a simple thread and I'll dump, dump of the jvm while it, while it is working through all of this would be enough to answer these questions and uh, if we don't have block threads increasing block test the threads uh, over time um, for the git operation or uh, waiting threads then i think we have nothing to worry about but if, it, if that is the case then we should define the behavior um, during that because that i see as the critical piece of the whole uh, operation that we're trying to do so yeah i mean um, this is more related to performance i would say but uh, yeah if it's something that we could uh, attempt uh, do you think mark that is something that we should keep within the goals or something uh, more of a good to have if we if we have time we should approach this uh, activity I, I think it's a good, I think you've got a good point to, to consider it. Let's do, let's, if it's at all possible for Hrushikesh to fit it in, let's do it. I, I think mm -hmm. it's a, just a safety check, particularly Hrushikesh, I am not a, a skilled thread programmer. And therefore there is every risk that will make some mistake and I will fail to detect it. And so technique like, techniques like what Rishab is suggesting are very healthy for us because it's admitting Mark Waite thinks single threaded and he has a very simple way of thinking about things. And, and the danger is when, when, when we're wrong about those simple ways of thinking about things, we could risk taking down the controller, right? We could risk bringing it down for just threat overload. So I, I think it's a good, it's a good, good question to ask Rishab. And uh, Rishikesh, I can share the steps to do it. Um, I mean, as far as I remember, there there is a uh, Java CLI to to do this. And, uh, this is pre-installed in most of the environment. But let me let me confirm on that and share those steps. If 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 you wish to do that exercise, uh, uh, don't we uh, need you know other? Uh, don't we need uh, you know some other threads which access this bit caches at the same time uh, as I am running the maintenance task? You know to know whether uh, uh, any threads are waiting or not. So um, this is the part where I, I I think I need to look at the code more. But um, Rishikesh, my assumption is when you have multiple tasks, uh, sorry, multiple tasks. When I say task, um, a maintenance task. When a user is going to assign multiple maintenance tasks, is a thing is a single thread going to do all of this or am i going to yeah. launch multiple threads with each new task a, a single thread is going to run all of these tasks so i'm adding all these tasks into a maintenance queue and then i dequeue each task and one a uh, one thread is created it runs the maintenance task it, it gets terminated then a new thread is created which runs the next maintenance task if it is present in the queue and then it get, uh, it uh, executes all the maintenance tasks and then it gets terminated uh, it runs the maintenance tasks from all the caches and then it gets terminated hmm. so then it i don't see a case where other threads would be waiting for uh, for taking the execution since so as i understand each user's request to perform maintenance would be performed by a single thread and it is not possible within that session that we launch multiple threads. Yes. And yeah. uh, the only only case where threads would be blocked is assume any other plugin which wants to access this cache, okay, which wants to do some operation. Those threads would be waiting. So I am not sure about uh, what like they would be blocked, right? So I'm not sure how would that impact the performance. Because assume a GC running for 15 minutes and then there is some uh, Jenkins job configured to run on that cache, but it it can't uh, it, or, it, or it couldn't run it because there is a lock. Uh, and the git cache at uh, the git maintenance task is being run. So would that be postponed or how would that what would that how would that affect? 
so uh, do we do we classify the kinds of uh, so so the now you're talking about so i was talking about the lock that you have created for the whole execution but i think the lock that you are talking about is for the cache directory that you acquire right when you want to yeah. get the cache in yeah. well is, yes yes it isn't isn't the isn't the lock you're talking about actually a lock that is acquired by command line git while it's running for instance the gc it applies a it applies a lock on that repository that that locks all command line git operations for the duration of the gc now i don't know that that happens for anything except gc but i thought that if you've got a gc running you can't do other operations in that repository concurrently uh, uh, actually uh, here there are two locks if you think about it technically one lock is uh, done automatically by the git uh, tool by the git software and we have another lock uh, internally in jenkins okay so uh, the uh, the lock done by the git tool software that lock is uh, um, added to prevent other maintenance tasks to run on it I'm not sure if it prevents other uh, Git commands, but I when I read about it, it was to prevent other maintenance tasks. So that is one law. I don't think that law should be of any concern because that is internally done by Git. The other law which we have in Jenkins, I'm worried about that law because if we are using, uh, if we are running maintenance tasks and if any other, uh, plugin tries to access that uh, directly, what would happen to them? Would they be in a waiting state or, or like they would be in a waiting state? So, uh... no, so uh, Rishikesh, uh, have, so this is the log that is implemented by the abstract gate SCM, right? Yes. Where the caches are. So um, I think what we should understand is, I think, I believe that the nature of the log is, um, it, it is a re-entrant log. A re-entrant log. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so um, I'm not hundred percent sure here, but so there are ways for us to have locks where read access to the lock, even if a lock, if a lock is acquired to a resource, threads can read it and they don't have to wait to read on the resource, but if they want to perform a write, then they have to wait to do uh, anything on the uh, resource. So uh, I, I think we should look into that. What is exactly happening there? And uh, uh, Rishikesh, you are performing a purely a read operation on the caches. No, but that is when, when you're looking at the cache, when you take the cache uh, log um, and you, so no, okay. So that is a write operation. There is a read yeah. and write both. So we, yeah. we can't, yeah. Mm. And yes. then even though another plugin tries to access this cache, we are not uh, like, how do we differentiate it? So, uh, a read operation or a write operation because uh, assume a git status mm -hmm. command could be a read operation but then uh, when i do a git commit uh, operation it could be a write operation so mm, so you're worried about the fact that if git plugin acquires a lock on a particular cache and it's a gc operation so it means that it would have that lock for a certain period of time what happens if any other project or any other component of Jenkins is trying to acquire that lock as well. Yeah. That is, yes. In how do you? Is the only way that I have seen? Uh, I mean, how do you ensure that a, per, a single thread does not take more time? that would create a situation where you have, uh, let's say a huge number of block threads that would concern you is that uh, you, um, so you define a waiting behavior for, uh, for the threads that have to wait on a log, but I believe that we have, we would have to change the very nature of how, um, logs are acquired for each individual cache at abstract Git SEM level. And that is something that we should be very careful about since that is used by abstract data is a, is a contract that is inferred by a lot of uh, plugins, I would believe. So to go on that territory would mean that we would absolutely would want, would want to be sure about what we think here. 
change the behavior. But I guess a thread dump in that sense, <clears throat> Rishikesh could help you to understand, to analyze what is exactly going on in your, um, you know, in the JVM that is initiated, <clears throat> the Jenkins, you would, you would be able to see, uh, for an example, if you're on Mark's machine and, you know, I, I guess this, um, uh, this scenario could be replicated where your maintenance task is running and let's say a multi-branch project is also simultaneously running then you could look you could analyze the thread dump over time and see what is happening is there a concern well and not? and i i promise you that machine has it if you want to tell me when you're interested in doing that analysis i can exercise it because there is there is a repository on that machine that's used for multi-branch that is 160 or more megabytes with 50 or 60 branches and commits that are arriving on many of those branches simultaneously and jobs that are defined to use that cache through five or six multi-branch pipelines. So, so it's, it's horrible and embarrassing what I've done there, but it's a good stress test. So, so yeah, it's it's called the Jenkins-Bugs repository in case you're interested which one it is. If you ever see that one in any of my diagnostic stuff, that's a an enormous repository that's just filled with, with data that's used to help me validate certain Jenkins bugs are still bugs or are no longer bugs. So there's this tool called JStack which comes within the mandatory pack. So you can, uh, you can take a look at this Rishikesh. I even have the command. So you need to know the process ID. If you know that, you just need to um, tell JSTAG that, and then it would uh, basically do the analysis, for, uh, do the dump and uh, store it in it, some text file that you can then an analyze. I'll go through that. Yes. So I'll try configuring some, you know, tasks on my side once or in my full time and uh, you know, check if, when they are colliding and what's happening kind of thing. But I mean, in terms of your priority, this would not be the first one, right? You, you already have some tasks that you need to do for it. Uh, also, there was one thing regarding security. I am not sure if, uh, like, I feel it's a security issue. Like, we have a hash set, right? So, we have a hash set where we are storing all the cache entries. And assume any class is, uh, you know, inheriting uh, this abstract git SCM. And uh, if they if they iterate through that hash set, they can get the lock of that uh or, you know of that uh get repository and then uh, us, and then think of a case where they don't uh set that lock or they use that lock in a, a you know inappropriate way uh i think that would cause a bit of a, a bit of, you know some kind of chaos on our system i'm not sure or like about it Because uh, our uh, we have a hash hash map concurrent hash map which takes a cache entry as its key and a lock as its value, and we have a hash set uh, of you know we have a hash set of all the cache entries. So if anyone iterates over it and you know uh, law uh, you know passes it to the concurrent hash map, they can get the lock. And they can lock that repositories. I'm not sure if this is a security issue, but I wanted to discuss it once. And if someone is able to acquire, I mean, get to that point, then even if they don't have the hash map, they would be able to uh, use the API that is used to directly get all the caches and acquire a lock at that level, right? 
and that is already exposed. So I mean, the assumption is that they are able to somehow access the Git internally uh, the Git plugin APIs. And if that is the case, then I mean, how would we able to stop? If if they can access our hash map, then they probably can access right. the caches. What, once you're once you're inside the Jenkins controller's Java process, all bets are off, right? Yes, yes, there are some things we can do to defend, but I can do ACL dot as and become become an administrator, right? So I I don't, yeah, I, I don't think there's I don't think that defense is one we need to worry about. But I, I was interpreting Hrushikesh's concern as an API level threat that there was someone who inherits from abstract get get SCM project gets access to data that we would prefer they didn't have didn't have available. Yeah. And I don't know how to solve that one. You might want to look at Joshua Block's material um, called Effective Java. He's got a he's got he's, he's got some of the things about things like that and and inheritance design patterns. I I am not nearly well enough first to be be a good coach on that. I was also thinking of the uh, I had another concern regarding the maintenance staff. Uh, so basically, right now, uh, assume uh, uh, some uh, a plugin is uh, you know running a, uh, some command on a Git cache, and uh, uh, at the same time, uh, the Git maintenance task wants to run, you know, the maintenance task on that cache. Do we want to skip uh, the maintenance task if it's being executed by some other plugin, or do we wait for that plugin to release the log and then we? execute the maintenance task. Hmm. Okay, good algorithmic question. So if we skip, there's a risk that we will never get a chance to do any the maintenance on that repository. But yeah. if we don't skip, there's a risk we won't do the maintenance on any repository because we're blocked for a very long time on that repository, right? Yeah. Now I'm not entirely sure. I'm really confident which of those two is is healthier, which is not right. Because I guess sacrificing one repository for the good of the many is probably the better choice. Think of Mr. Spock, and maybe maybe that's what we need is to admit admit that the good of the many outweigh the good of the few in this case. Maybe, but but that may mean some large repository never gets garbage collected because if it's if it's large and also very active and, and the linux kernel is a is a an excellent example of that right for 15 or more years it's had an awe inspiring rate of commits arriving in that repository and they are small very well vetted thoroughly thought through commits but there are so many people committing that it's just got a lot of history and, and so we might conceptually, if somebody's trying to garbage collect the Linux kernel, but on a very busy multi-pipeline, multi-branch pipeline machine, they may never get the chance. But I think that's still probably better than, oh, we'll just block and nobody else will get anything done because we're waiting. Uh, also, if you think about it, uh, 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 if uh, you know GC would be scheduled once in two weeks or once in a week, or so, once in two weeks or something, it uh, like the previous week it would have been scheduled and maintained, right? So it wouldn't be as worse as it was right. before. Yeah, it, and if, you know if we skip a week and then uh, do it the next week, I think it would be fine. So well, and and I think those kinds of risks. If, if the UI can help people see those kinds of risks, they may thank us very much, right? If you show them, hey, here's a table of when we last ran the, this, this task and they sort it by date and say, whoa, the last time I garbage collected this repository was eight weeks ago. Why is that? And, and that, that may be a very helpful thing for that administrator to, oh, why is my garbage, why is my... 
why is that maintenance task not being run when, when I expected it to be run? So I think there has to be a consistent. So if right now a, a multi-branch pipeline is running and I go to the machine and I uh, run the git GC command, it won't stop that multi-branch um, uh, job. Right. It, and let's say, let's say the GC, I started the GC before the multi-branch operation. Uh, uh, and uh, then the multi-branch project or the job started executing. It won't stop it from happening. The, right, the, but job, the job and the pipeline, as far as I know, no. However, get access operations, I don't know about that, right? Because if it's attempting to access the cache and it honors the cache lock that abstract get SEM source has, it may block waiting for that lock. Hmm. But I mean, so my what I what I'm trying to arrive at is that um, um, there should be. Uh, I mean, if Git, G, if I manually run these operations without using Jenkins, I mean, this is just a manual Git operation that I'm trying to run. And I, hmm. when I do that, I don't have to acquire cache locks. I mean, myself, right? I'm just I'm asking Git to do whatever it has to do. Right. And the lock. That, okay. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. No, I'm, I was just saying that if that is in, in, in within that behavior, I am uh, my Jenkins operations are not affected, at least uh, in terms of when I look at my job, the execution time doesn't increase much. I think that is the consistency that we should aim for when we are doing this via Git plugin. Uh, whatever logs that we acquire or however we do it, it doesn't matter. But for the user, it should appear the same. And uh, that should it shouldn't happen that to run the maintenance tasks because we have additional logs or let's say we you know we block the cache we can't i can't even run my project because of that that is something that would be new for a user is as i understand this mm. and that's one i think we'll need to check particularly with one of these very large repositories right we may want to do an explicit test start the garbage collection on the Linux kernel, and then launch a multi-branch pipeline job indexing that, do they, do they, does it complete? And does it complete mm -hmm. promptly or is it in fact blocked waiting for the lock on the cache? Yes, that would be a good, good exercise. Any other topics, Rishikesh? So, so regard, so okay, so let me get this clear. So, regarding uh, uh, execution of maintenance uh, a task, like if the lock has been blocked by some other plugin, so do I skip it or? Uh, I think you should go? skip it, Rishab. Do you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I, I, I think skip skip is a is a reasonable choice, and hope that we'll be back to it later. Okay. Uh, there was one last point uh, regarding, you know, getting the Git version uh, on in the Git plugin. Okay. When I was reading the code, uh, when I implemented it, uh, we are going, we are calling the native, uh, you know, uh, Git CLI tool, and uh, you know, on the computer. But then uh, Jenkins has various ways of getting different. You can where you can configure different versions of the Git of you know the Git software, like the Git tool. So how how do I know that the Git version which I am getting is the same as the one configured in Jenkins? Is it always the same, or uh, imagine like uh, think of a case that like normally you know there is always one particular. Uh, version set on the computer, right? So am I getting only that version is what is that's my question. So so I think you want to ask for the tool that's default. You want to ask for the tool that's the top of the list of list of Git tools and take that one as your as your belief this is the one that's available on the controller. 
Rishab, this is where now we got to go back to your project. I think that was the kind of assumption we were making there as well, right? There is a there is a concept of the default Git implementation. It's the top of the list. And in in some cases, like on ci.jenkins.io, oddly enough, the top of the list is actually JGit. So you probably have to ask the question, what's the top of the list? Is it an implementation of CLI Git API impl? And if not, walk walk the list down. Mm, yes, that is what we we did for the Git tool chooser class that we have. So there was so what we did was that we would uh, we took the default in, uh, installation and then we checked if it was what was the kind of instance that is it a JGit or a CLI implementation and then uh, we would check uh, the um, compatibility per node is is this compatible for this node or not and then if it's not then we would iterate keep iterating through the available git options that we have uh, the uh, tool options that we have and once we got uh, something that works then we would take that and move forward uh, yes what exactly is compatible here because when i've seen in the git client plugin there is no way of getting the version of the you know git uh you know the underlying git uh, tool which is being used so uh, so what you're saying is from the git tool instance itself you can't get the version right so for me that was not a question that i needed to answer what i needed to answer was that hey, let's say if i have a cli gate or a j gate uh, whatever node i'm working on is it compatible or is it installed there i, I mean i was answering those questions so whatever Git tool I use is the correct one for that particular node. Yes, but I don't, yeah, I also don't believe that you can get the version from there. So for you to use the default one makes sense, right? What is default is what you use. So, uh, you have a list of options. So basically, as default, the one which is already installed on the computer or like on on my computer or is it something which is configured in jenkins but is not you know uh like by passing some other path to the git one uh to the uh you know git tool which is installed but when i run a git command on my computer it is not the same as the default present in jenkins I need to see if it's if the default installation is what we have on the system or would it be something suppose, that the user would, yeah yeah if it is the de if the default one is the same as the one in the system then we have nothing to worry about but if it isn't then you know there would be uh like uh, uh variations because assume uh the system one has a two dot uh eighteen of git, git version and he uh the same system even has 2.2.30 but it's configured on jenkins okay so we would be getting a 2.30 2.18 version but we could we would be running legacy git maintenance stuff even though on jenkins the default one is configured so that is i mean that is mark that is possible right for me to set um, uh, a particular git installation as my uh, as my default option for the operations that i wish to perform within jenkins uh, it, is. it is as far as i understand it now i thought that and i haven't proven but i thought that the controller would consistently select the first git tool that was listed that it would so it would in the in the configure global tools page there's a git section and that mm -hmm. can, includes an ordered list of tools and as far as i understood it it takes the top of that list for the controller and i don't think it now i i could be wrong but i didn't think it even applied any label selection logic or anything like that it just i thought takes the top but but again, I could be wrong. It's it's worth a it's worth a safety check just to be sure. 
That and is true. As far as I remember, as well, it takes it simply takes the first one, and there is no sort of intelligence there that would you know. Right. If if you if the it. yeah if the administrator no, wants to sorry. use a different Git implementation, they must put it at the top of the list for the controller. At least that's that's what I've observed on ci.jenkins.io. That that's where we intentionally put jgit at the top of the list, and we see that it is used. Hmm. Now that's a different. Think, oh, go ahead. I was just saying, Mark, that 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 is what I think. What Shikesh's concern is, right? If we don't know the version of that git, and if we know that within the list of options there is one that we could use. Which is not a legacy, so that we don't just run legacy git maintenance, git maintenance tasks. Then, I mean, that could be something that we are missing out on. If well, and and that may be a okay. <clears throat> at minimum, if we detect that condition, can we log it and tell the administrator warning? You have you have this invalid config or you have this suboptimal configuration. It's not even particularly invalid, right? It's what you've described mm -hmm. to Shikesh is they're running we they've somehow chosen to run 1.8 but on that same node on that same controller here's 2.37 that we could have used and it would have been much better than that ancient 1.8 version that they have yeah but you don't have a way to understand that right Mishikesh? i mean how would we know that from the yeah. git tool itself right that yeah. is the information that is not stored no there there is no uh, way of getting the version as well. Although, although maybe we could do them a favor by telling them how old their Git version is, and that's all we do. And we always tell them at startup, your Git version is lacks the following capabilities. Because Rishab, your capabilities checks were exactly that, right? It was I don't want to ask, I don't want to do this if I know that the command line Git lacks these capabilities. And Trushikesh, you may just as a matter of on startup, put a nice warning in the log file that says your controller has such and such a version of Git. It will not be able to do the following things, or its performance will be less, would be less than if you were to upgrade to a to Git two dot something better. I actually kind of added that check already in the UI where I show a red color, a red oh, good. color version of the okay. yeah. I, I I've just been through a terrible experience with a bun a, a number of Jenkins users on CentOS 7 telling me that we broke them with a security fix we just released because CentOS 7 runs an ancient version of SSH that we had missed testing. So so this is sort of hot on my list at the moment. I apologize for banging on something like this. Anything else, Rushikesh? Uh, so uh, finally, uh, the main objectives are you re revamping the UI, okay, making it a bit be uh, better uh, and easy to understand. One is to display uh, the data execution data, uh, like how. And one more is strengthening the fundamentals. I, I feel strengthening the fundamentals of how we are executing the maintenance tasks. Because I feel these are the project goals. I, I like those goals. Same. Yes. I believe that is the order of priority as well, right? As you um, said. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Anything else? That's it, that's it. Then good luck on your exams. Focus on those exams, do well, and we will talk to you again when we next meet. Thank you. All the best, Rishikesh. All the best.